and welcome to the Living with Wildlife webinar. My name is Lindsay and I'm a park interpreter in Birds Hill Provincial Park located on Treaty 1 territory and homeland of the Red River Métis, whose peoples are deeply connected with the plants and animals of this land. Now, before we get started this evening, I just wanted to let everyone know that this presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Manitoba Parks YouTube channel. All participants are in listen only mode, muted and cameras are disabled. Over the course of the webinar, please use the chat box for comments, or if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A on the Zoom window, and we will strive to answer as many of your questions as we can towards the end of the presentation. So tonight we're learning about some of the wildlife most commonly encountered in Manitoba and how you can ensure you have a safe encounter with them. So we're going to start off tonight with a bit of a poll question. So I'm just going to bring that up here. And if you are on a, a device such as uh, an iPhone or a tablet, you may have to click the poll button on your device uh, in order to be able to see the question. So I've just launched the question here and it is, which wildlife have you had a personal encounter with in Manitoba? And you can go ahead and select all that apply. So some of your choices to choose from there include white-tailed deer, black bears, wolves, coyotes, fox, rabbits, uh, beavers, and there's a few more down at the bottom, birds, frogs, and turtles. So we'll just give that another moment. Uh, and a personal encounter could mean that you have seen them in the wild, uh, maybe you've heard them, um, any kind of encounter that you've had like that, and you can click all that apply. All right, we'll just give it another moment there. Looks like most of our answers have come in. We'll give you a couple more seconds. Countdown, three, two, one, and we're gonna end the poll and we're going to check out the results. So we're gonna share our results here. Um, so just taking a quick look at this, it looks like a lot of our participants this evening uh, have had encounters with white-tailed deer, uh, a lot of people with coyotes, uh, and as well, turtles, frogs, birds, rabbits, beavers. A lot of people have seen foxes, that's really exciting. A uh, few people have seen wolves and even black bears. So that's super exciting. I'm uh, glad that everyone has had some sort of wildlife encounters. That's great. So now this evening, we're going to be focusing on uh, some of the different animals that we see in Manitoba. Now there are over 1200 different species of wildlife in our province, everything from polar bears and beluga whales in the north to healthy populations of black bears and white tailed deer uh, throughout the province and numerous species of birds, amphibians, fish, reptiles and insects throughout Manitoba. Now wildlife is all around us. And it's a privilege when we get to see these animals in their natural habitats. But we do need to know how to coexist with them to keep ourselves safe and how to keep them protected and safe in the environment as well. So wild animals are vital to the biodiversity of our environment for keeping balance between all living things and creating a healthy ecosystem. Now tonight, we're going to focus on three main species that often receive a lot of interactions with humans during the winter months. And we're gonna find out how you can ensure you and your family are staying wildlife smart around these animals. So the ones we're gonna be focusing on tonight include our white-tailed deer, coyotes, and also songbirds. Now, what exactly is it to be wildlife smart? Well, wildlife smart means understanding why we have conflicts with wildlife. Now this can be for a variety of different reasons, such as changing populations, areas where wildlife find their food, could also be highway collisions, or habitat loss. Now being wildlife smart also means understanding how we can take action to reduce the risk of conflict with wildlife. 
and knowing how to respond appropriately when interacting with wildlife to ensure our safety and protection for the animal. So we need to remember, we are a part of the environment, not apart from it. It's our responsibility to ensure we are protecting it for the health of the land, the wildlife, and ourselves. So tonight, we're going to take a look at our three wildlife species and how we can ensure we're having safe encounters with them. First one that we're going to focus on is the white-tailed deer. Now, white-tailed deer are one of Manitoba's most valued wildlife species. They are very adaptable and can easily live in close proximity to people, which provides interactions and potential conflict between us and deer. Now, white-tailed deer are actually not native to Manitoba. They are native to the state of Virginia in the United States. Now, these creatures migrated north along the Red River into Manitoba in the 1880s. Today, we find them throughout southern and central Manitoba as far north as the Paw. White-tailed deer habit uh, sorry, white-tailed deer habitat in Manitoba includes agricultural lands, northern boreal forest, aspen parkland, grasslands, and eastern deciduous forests. The average population of deer in Manitoba is between 150,000 and 160,000 animals. So it's a very healthy population in our province. Females are called does, males are called bucks, and the adorable little babies are called fawns. Now, white-tailed deer are polygamous, and breeding occurs during the rutting season, which starts in mid-October. It peaks around mid-November and usually ends in early December. Bucks lose their antlers after the rutting season finishes. So only the males, only the bucks, are the ones who actually grow antlers. The females do not. White-tailed deer tracks show their two hooves and look kind of like an upside down heart in the snow. Now deer will often create their own trails through deep snow that they use for quick escapes from predators and humans. So how do deer survive in the winter? It's pretty cold out there some days in Manitoba. Well, white-tailed deer are very well adapted to our cold temperatures. In the fall, their winter hair grows up through their summer hair to form a grayish brown coat that becomes much thicker and really well insulated. Yearlings often stay with their mothers for protection during the first winter, bedding down under trees at night for protection. Deer are herbivores and their natural food sources are vegetation. In the winter, they will dig under snow for grass and eat bark off trees. Poison ivy becomes an important winter food source for deer. Now their scat reflects their diet in winter, woody, dark in color, and about the size of chocolate covered peanuts in a pile. However, I'm pretty sure they do not taste like chocolate covered peanuts, so I would not recommend trying these. Now, deer typically become food stressed every winter and have developed physiological and behavioral adaptations to help them survive. Starting in late fall, natural deer food drops in quality and deer shift to eating lower quality woody materials. This seasonal dietary digestive change can, disrupt, can be disrupted by providing deer relatively high quality food and can lead to bloating, diarrhea, enteritis, which is an inflammation of the intestine, as well as bovine tuberculosis and chronic wasting disease, which has now been identified in Manitoba. So deer have starved to death with full stomachs in winter because they could not digest high carbohydrate foods like hay, grains, corn, and alfalfa. 
This is one of the biggest reasons why feeding deer is so dangerous for the animal. And some of you that are on social media might even recognize these photos. These came out today on the Manitoba Parks Facebook and Twitter. Um, this is something we discovered in Birds Hill Park just this past weekend. This is a big dumping of grain uh, that was put on the side of South Drive. Uh, somebody thinking that they're helping to feed the wildlife in the park. Unfortunately, as we've just discovered, uh, this is quite dangerous for deer in the wintertime. This can cause them uh, a lot of digestive issues. It can even kill them. And so fortunately, our park patrol in the park spent a few hours shoveling and cleaning this all up and removing it. And so this is one of the reasons why we really discourage people from feeding wildlife. Now deer uh, uh, are, a lot of our conflicts uh, that uh, happen with deer uh, arise around encounters with relating to a number of factors such as attractants. Uh, attractants can include things uh, that wild animals may be considered to be potential food sources, cover or even water sources. Deer may be drawn into areas of human development due to the presence of attractants, such as food and shelter, such as what we see in parts of Winnipeg. So often when we try to hang bird feeders to feed the birds, they can attract other critters such as deer. Habituation can also be another cause for conflict. A habituated animal has learned through repeated positive or neutral encounters with people that there is little reason to fear us. These animals grow tolerant to people being in close proximity to them and don't avoid people like normal wild animals do. Now food conditioning is when wild animals become attracted to human foods or garbage because previous food rewards have given them positive reinforcement for this behavior. These animals may actively seek out human foods, putting them at danger. Deer that are accustomed to humans and those attracted to supplemental food sources can cause damage to surrounding plants, trees, shrubs, agricultural crops, and stored hay. Now, supplemental feeding has the potential to increase deer reproduction and survival rates, leading to artificially increased populations that the habitat may not be able to sustain. This can cause long-term damage to the habitat for both deer and other wildlife. Now, there is no rehabilitation of white-tailed deer in Manitoba. So if you habituate deer, we cannot rehabilitate them to undo the learned behavior of associating people with food so they will stop this behavior and be released back into the wild. So we have to remember these are wild animals. They are not pets. There is not a safe way to feed wild deer. Their populations naturally regulates and balances with predators and available natural food sources. By feeding deer non-natural food sources, you are interfering with the natural balance of their population and the predator populations that prey on them. So how do we reduce these risks and have safe wildlife encounters with deer? Well, the first thing is don't feed them. This goes for on your own private property, on the side of a road, or in a natural setting like a park. Never try to feed deer by hand or try to pet them. We really need to remember these are wild animals. They have teeth, they have hooves, they are unpredictable. We also need to keep our distance from them. So if you're trying to take a photo, don't get too close, keep your distance. We can also reduce the risk of deer vehicle collisions on roadways by watching for deer crossing signs and slowing down, especially at dusk and dawn. Uh, nighttime is when deer are most active and most difficult to see on the roadways. So one of the things you can do, and I often say this is great for children that are passengers in vehicles, you can watch for the reflection of headlights in the eyes of deer called eyeshine. Passengers can help by watching along the sides of the roads. 
If you do see deer on the side of the road, watch for others that might be hidden in the tree line. Deer often travel in groups, and after one crosses the road, the others often follow. So it may not be the first one uh, that might get hit by a vehicle. It might be the ones afterwards. So you really need to slow down and watch to make sure that there's not more of them following behind. If you do see deer stopped on the side of the road or even on the roadway, stop your vehicle and hold your horn to scare them off the road. I know this seems really kind of cruel and mean that you're scaring them, but this is the best way to teach deer that the roads and vehicles are not where they should be and to avoid them in the future. Now, if you do encounter deer while out on a trail, in a park, or even out in your yard, keep your distance. White-tailed deer are wild animals and you should never approach them, especially those with young, as they may become aggressive, although this is pretty rare. Laying their ears back is a sign of aggression. If a deer displays this behavior, slowly and quietly move away from the animal, backing up and giving it lots of space. If taking photos, keep your distance. Do not try to get closer to the animal just to get a better shot. And last but not least, always, always, always keep your dog on a leash to avoid chasing the deer. So practicing these wildlife smart tips will ensure we have safe encounters with deer and protect the species. Our next animal that we're gonna take a look at is the coyote. Now, most of the time, coyotes are timid animals that try to avoid interactions with people. However, coyotes are also very adaptable animals that can be equally comfortable living in urban, rural, and wilderness areas. With coyotes living among us more and more, we need to learn how to coexist with them. Now, you may have heard me say both words, coyote and coyote. So which one is it? Well, the proper pronunciation of this animal is coyote. The mispronunciation of coyote was popularized with the introduction of the Looney Tunes character, Wiley Coyote, created by Chuck Jones and Michael Maltese in 1949. And the name has stuck ever since. So whether you use the word coyote or coyote, both are socially acceptable, but the proper term for these animals is coyote. Now coyotes are found throughout North America. They are one of the few mammals whose range is increasing despite extensive persecution by people. Their traditional habitats in Manitoba include aspen parkland and short and mixed grass prairies. However, they have spread north into the boreal forest and into more developed urban areas, including some of our cities. Reports of coyotes in Winnipeg and Brandon have increased substantially over the past five years, likely as a result of increased prey species, such as deer and rabbits, and other available food sources. Coyotes are slimmer and smaller than wolves. Coyotes weigh between 9 and 23 kilograms and measure between 120 and 150 centimeters from nose to tail. They stand about 58 to 66 centimeters at the shoulder. Coyotes ears are wide, pointed, and erect. It has a tapering muzzle and black nose. Now, unlike most dogs, the top of the muzzle on coyotes forms an almost continuous line with the forehead. They have yellow eyes, which is also unlike most domestic dog breeds. Coyotes fur is generally a tawny gray, yellowish in color, while they're, uh, and sorry, they're tawny gray color with black tips. The legs, muzzle, and back of the ears are more yellowish in color, while the throat, belly, and inside of the ears are whiter. The tail is darker on top and lighter on the underside and typically hangs low between the back legs when they walk. 
Coyote's paws are more elongated than that of a dog or a wolf. They have four toes with non-retractable claws, which are not used in attack or defense, as they are typically blunted from constant contact with the ground. Now the coyote's sense of hearing and smell are so well developed that a sudden odor or noise can make it change its course in mid-step. Now like the wolf, the coyote's best known trait is its yelping and howling cry, a sequence of high-pitched ear-piercing bays. The coyote can also bark, growl, wail, and squeal. Although often silent in daytime, it may make itself heard at any time from sunset to sunrise, and especially at dusk and dawn. Now, coyotes are well adapted for winter. Their fur is long and soft and well suited to protect them from the cold. Because it is a light colored in the winter and dark in the summer, it blends in well with its seasonal surroundings. Now mating takes place in February and March, so right now, this time of year, and these monogamous couples maintain a clean den underground that provides protection from winter storms and birthing pups in the spring. Now if food supplies are abundant, pups may stay with their parents the following winter and form a small family pack. Now coyotes are opportunistic omnivores. They will eat rodents, rabbits, small mammals, and even small white-tailed deer. They're also scavengers and they'll eat carrion, which are dead animals. They will also go after pets, such as dogs and cats, especially ones off leash. So this is another great reason to keep your dogs on leash and maybe keep your cats inside. Coyotes can be predators of farm animals as well, but they often will go after smaller rodents that cause more damage and disease on a farm rather than going after the livestock themselves. They will, however, go after chickens. So if you keep chickens, it's important to keep them in a fenced enclosure. Now, coyote scat, that's the technical term for animal poop, varies depending on their diet. If they are eating a lot of mammals, their scat will often contain a lot of animal hair in it. Now, a lot of the conflict that we encounter with coyotes are as a result of natural habitat loss and the animal being highly adaptable to human development. Being an opportunistic eater increases the occurrences of coyotes coming into contact with humans. Now in cities such as Winnipeg and Brandon, we are seeing more signs of coyotes. They're likely following the rivers in search of food. As prey populations increase, such as the deer population in Winnipeg, the predaceous coyote population also increases. Now Winnipeg coyote sightings have definitely increased over the last few years. Intentionally feeding deer on private property can lure coyotes to these areas. Coyotes are opportunistic hunters, so an off-leash dog can be viewed as easy prey or a threat to their territory, which can instigate an attack on the dog and rarely humans. So how do we reduce these risks and have safe wildlife encounters with coyotes? Well, First of all, never feed them. Can you see a theme here? Don't feed the wildlife. Making food available to coyotes, either directly or indirectly by feeding their prey, such as birds, rabbits, or deer, may attract coyotes and other predators to the area. Coyotes that have been fed by people will become increasingly comfortable in approaching people and increasingly aggressive around them. Coyotes are attracted to food and food waste on properties, such as fallen fruit, pet food, bird seed, and garbage. So it's important to clean these up regularly. Pick fruit from your yard as it falls, Feed your pets inside a building rather than outside. 
and clean up bird seed if you have bird feeders on your property and avoid overflowing garbage, recycling or compost piles to prevent coyotes from being attracted to your property. When outdoors, be aware of your surroundings. This is a really common one nowadays. Everyone likes to go for a walk or a jog or even a bike ride and have uh, their headphones in listening to some music or a podcast but it's really recommended not to wear earbuds or earphones to listen to music when you're outdoors in an area where you are likely to encounter coyotes or other wildlife. Be especially observant between dusk and dawn when coyotes and other wildlife are more active. You want to be able to hear what's around you in your surroundings. Now, keeping dogs on leash or in a fenced in yard is another really important thing to do. So never let your dog run loose, even if, uh, even if you are there to monitor, the, to monitor them. Coyotes will go after dogs as easy prey and uh, to protect their territory. So you always want to walk your dog on leash in appropriate areas, such as neighborhood sidewalks or designated trails in a park setting. Never let your dog run off leash, especially in rural areas where coyotes may be living. You also have to be aware of trap lines that might be out in rural areas, possibly set to catch coyotes. This would be another reason to be keeping your dog on leash and by your side under direct control at all times. Now, if you have small children, you want to keep them in your site in a fenced in yard, especially if there are coyotes in your area. Teach young children never to approach wildlife, even pet dogs, as you don't know how the animal is going to react. Now, if you do encounter a coyote, they are usually more scared of you than you are of them. So never approach or crowd the animal. Give it an escape route. Stop, remain calm, and assess the situation. Do not run. You may cause it to chase you. Pick up small children and small dogs, and if you have larger dogs, pull them in closer to you. Never let your dog chase after the coyote because it's likely to turn around and attack. If the coyote seems unaware of you, move away quietly when it is not looking in your direction. Watch the coyote as you leave the area in case it begins to follow you. And I'll tell you guys a really quick little story here. I had a group of girl guides out a few weeks back, uh, actually at a park in the city. Uh, so not at a bird's hill, but in a city park. And we had some coyotes run past us while we were out on our walk. And we gathered our group together, uh, kind of got into a big clump. And because they were just little girls, uh, we sang Twinkle Twinkle Little Star as loud as we could. And that ensured that the animals knew we were there. It kind of chased them away. They ran off into the bush in the other direction. And we made sure they were definitely far away before we turned and continued walking on our trail. Um, so that is one of my own little encounters with coyotes in the city of Winnipeg. And it does seem to happen more and more all the time. So being aware of your surroundings and knowing what to do if you encounter these animals is definitely important. Now, in the like, unlikely event that a coyote might approach you, what you want to do is haze the animal to ensure it associates people with being a threat. So you want to maintain eye contact and stay facing the animal, make yourself look big, wave your arms, clap your hands, throw rocks or sticks at it, yell loudly for it to get away. So you want to give the animal lots of space and room to escape because a trapped animal is more dangerous and more likely to attack. Now coyotes are naturally timid animals. And it is important that we keep it that way for the safety of people and pets and protection for these animals. Now, our last creatures that we're gonna take a look at this evening are winter birds. So birds are excellent environmental indicators and studying birds allows us to understand the overall health of our ecosystem and the environment. 
Now in Manitoba, most birds have migrated south for the winter to find open water and food sources that are unavailable in the winter months. Birds that do stay here during the winter time are well adapted to survive the cold temperatures. Birds are warm blooded animals that have a much higher metabolism and thus a higher body temperature than humans. The average bird's body temperature is 105 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius. Birds retain heat in their body core by growing extra feathers in the fall time and fluffing out their feathers, making them appear fatter than they actually are. Now the space between the puffed out feathers warms from their body heat and keeps the bird warm, similar to when we wear a feather down jacket. The space in the jacket in between the feathers warms from our body heat and keeps us warm outside in the cold. Birds' legs and feet are covered with specialized scales that minimize heat loss. Birds can also control the temperature of their legs and feet separately from their bodies by constricting blood flow to their extremities, thereby reducing heat loss without risking frostbite. Birds that do stay in Manitoba during the winter are well adapted to find the food they need to survive including seeds, nuts, berries from the fall, and insects burrowing under tree bark. Some birds are scavengers and eat carrion, and birds of prey hunt for rodents hiding under the snow. You might be wondering, what possible conflicts could we have with winter birds? But there are some, and they mostly have to do with feeding birds which is not really necessary as they already ha have adapted to finding their own food. Now feeding birds can cause them to lose their natural instincts to find natural food and cause them to rely on humans to provide food for them. This can be especially dangerous when birds become habituated and then we stop filling the bird feeders. Bird feeders can also uh, attract other animals such as mice, squirrels, raccoons, skunks, and bears in the springtime. Now it's extremely important to remove bird feeders in spring and clean up leftover bird seed so as not to attract these creatures, especially bears that are looking for food. So how do we reduce these risks and have safe wildlife encounters with winter birds? Well, first of all, please do not put up bird feeders in parks or natural spaces. Although well-intended, these feeders are often not refilled or maintained throughout the winter, causing pollution in the park and attracting other wildlife such as bears, which causes other wildlife conflicts. Do not feed birds from your hand. I know on social media, there are hundreds of posts of people saying they went out to a park, especially to Birds Hill Park, to Chickadee Trail to feed the birds. Although this seems like a fun thing to do, you're causing the birds to become habituated to humans, causing them to lose their natural fear of us. If you do want to feed birds, only feed them on your personal property where you can monitor and upkeep the feeders. Check on them and be prepared to refill them every two to three days. This is one of the other problems with putting bird feeders out in a park area is often they're put out with well intentions, but then they're never refilled. And once they are empty, they become garbage. Now, if you do want to feed birds, only feed them on your personal property. Uh, and make sure that you are cleaning up bird feeders regularly to avoid the buildup of bacteria. This is something that can actually be deadly to birds. Now choosing good quality bird food, such as seeds, suet, nuts, peanut butter, and other items high in fat and calories to give birds plenty of energy to generate more body heat.
We never want to feed birds bread or other human foods that are going to be low in calories and just not a healthy option for them. You also want to make sure that you're hanging feeders on your property where squirrels and deer cannot reach them and away from windows to avoid birds flying into them, which can cause injury and death. If you really want to help birds, provide a heated bird bath with water for drinking and preening. Birds can melt water, can melt snow to drink if necessary, but doing so will lower their body temperature and use precious energy that is needed to maintain body heat. If the birds can drink from a heated bird bath, even in freezing temperatures, they will have a much better chance at survival. Now, if you have a pet cat, keeping it in the house works really well for protecting birds. One scratch from a cat's claw or bite from their teeth will cause a songbird to die because it will introduce bacteria into the bird's body and kill it. Since 1970, a staggering 3 billion birds, which is close to one in three individuals, have been lost from Canada and the United States due to habitat loss, pesticides, invasive species, outdoor cats, collisions, and climate change. Now there's a lot of things you can do to help birds, which also includes joining bird conservation efforts. And you can get involved in citizen science projects with Bird Studies Canada. They offer citizen science projects year round for adults and children to learn more about how to protect birds. And some of the fun ones that we've done in Birds Hill Park and in some of our other provincial parks in Manitoba include the Christmas bird count for kids. We've done some great backyard bird counts, the nocturnal owl survey. Uh, there's also Project Feeder Watch, which would be a great one to do in your backyard at home with a bird feeder. And then in the springtime, there's also Project Nest Watch. So now it's important for the health of our wildlife populations in Manitoba to ensure we are avoiding conflict with wildlife and promoting safe interactions and encounters with them. This will keep us safe and protect our wildlife. And we want to help protect our wildlife and keep them safe. So keep them wild, keep them safe. Now, before we finish off our presentation tonight, I just want to leave you with some resources. If you're wondering where you can find more information, uh, the Manitoba Wildlife Smart website, and I know it's a bit of a long uh, title there, but I'll leave that up. So if you want to jot that down, you can. Uh, but that is a really great resource on the internet for finding a lot of information on how to be wildlife smart. Uh, they've got a lot of great uh, information, a lot of good literature on uh, the uh, kind of pros and cons to uh, interacting with wildlife, some things that you need to keep in mind. Uh, if you do encounter wild animals, there's a lot of bear smart information on there as well. Uh, and because chronic wasting disease has recently been discovered in Manitoba, they've got a whole new section on chronic wasting disease information on the website. Another great resource is the tip line. So that's the turn in poachers line. It can also be the reporting forest fire line. Uh, so that is a 1-800 number uh, throughout Manitoba for um, anything to do with wildlife or uh, forest fires in our province. So if you ever have wildlife encounters that are uh, dangerous or reporting an injured or a sick uh, wild animal that you've encountered, that would be the phone number to call. Uh, now, if you are specifically in the Winnipeg area and you have maybe encountered uh, aggressive coyotes in the city, um, then there is the Winnipeg Police Services non-emergency phone number, uh, and that is a number that you can contact uh, for aggressive coyotes. Uh, so if it's just general coyote sightings in the city, 
um, but not in an aggressive manner, then no need to contact. But if you are seeing coyotes in an aggressive manner or in uh, kind of an area of concern, I know sometimes there have been coyote sightings near schools uh, or playgrounds. And so that would definitely be uh, a report that you would want to make and let the police services know. So I hope this evening you've had uh, an enjoyable time learning about our wildlife in the province and things you can do to help our wildlife and ensure that they stay safe as well as you and your family and your property are staying safe. Uh, if there are any questions at all, I welcome you to put them into the chat box or the Q&A box and I would be happy to answer your questions. Um, so I see that there are some comments in the chat box, so I'm just going to uh, take a quick look here and see if there are any questions. Um, so let me see here. Okay, to let them eat my Christmas tree. Oh, okay, so a uh, great question here from Liz. Is it okay to let them eat my Christmas tree? Um, I'm going to guess, Liz, that maybe you're referring to the deer, um, deer being herbivores. Um, so the deer may uh, eat from your Christmas tree. I'm assuming this is maybe one that you had in your house at Christmas time. It's been cut down, it's no longer alive, and you've maybe put it out. Um, really, the best thing to do with uh, old Christmas trees is actually to bring them into the city if you have access to bring them in um, to where they uh, turn the Christmas trees into wood chips. That would be a much better option. Um, the deer may eat from the Christmas tree, but because it is not living, um, the tree is cut down and dead, it's not going to be a really high source of nutrients for them. Uh, and so it's not going to be, you know, the greatest food source, um, depending where that tree is being put out, uh, you know, especially if it's near a roadway that may also be attracting deer um, onto your property or to be crossing roadways. And so that's definitely something that we want to be avoiding. So I would say a better bet would be to bring that Christmas tree into the city and uh, have it turned into wood chips, which can then be used for mulch and for gardening, uh, as opposed to letting the deer or other wildlife try to eat it. Um, all right. Uh, Somebody here has said they're writing a journalism assignment about coyotes in urban areas. Uh, so that's great. Uh, that I, you know what, I hope that maybe I can read that afterwards. You can always send it to uh, our park interpretation email. That would be great. Um, and yeah, I hope that this webinar has helped maybe provide you with some information for your assignment. Uh, again, if there are any questions, uh, I don't see any in the Q&A box, but I'll just give it another moment here. Um, and we'll just let you know that we do have other upcoming webinars um, from our provincial parks in Manitoba, from the White Shell, Spruce Woods, and Birds Hill. So feel free to uh, check out on Manitoba Parks uh, social media through Facebook or Twitter. Uh, if you're interested in attending other webinars, I know that coming up in the springtime, there will be one uh, coming out from Spruce Woods on the wild boars in Manitoba. And that one sounds really interesting. Um, and we do also have a lot of uh, in-person programs going on at our parks this winter, uh, snowshoeing events. There's learn to ice fish workshops in the white shell. Uh, and so a lot of great things happening in parks. Uh, in February right now, it is free park entry. And so we welcome everyone to come out and visit in provincial parks. Uh, no vehicle entry fee required. And uh, we hope to see you out in our parks this winter. All right, well, I don't see any other questions that have come in, so I'm just going to close it up for now. If you do think of any questions that you would like to ask, you can always send us an email to parkinterpretation at gov.mb.ca, and the park interpreters would be happy to answer those questions for you. Uh, I do see one that just popped up here from Hillary. Uh, we live in rural uh, egg land and have deer frequent our yard. Um, and their dog often tries to eat their droppings in the yard. Uh, we do our best to stop this, but is it bad for them? Um, 
you know what, their droppings probably are not the worst thing that a dog could eat, mainly because deer droppings, especially in the wintertime, are going to be made up of that woody vegetation that they've eaten. Um, so it's a very natural kind of substance, but uh, there could also be bacteria or other things that have gone through their digestive system. So probably not a great thing to be letting your dog uh, eat deer poop, um, you know, trying to clean that up as best as you can, uh, maybe some positive reinforcement for your dog not to be eating that and to be eating their own food or the dog treats that you give them. Um, so yeah, so that should definitely be something to uh, maybe look into a little further and make sure that uh, deer scat is not going to be harmful for your pets. Uh, Jesse, another question popped up here from Liz. Uh, they also live in East Interlake in a town with lots of deer. Uh, yes, about the Christmas tree. Okay, so yeah, that's great. Um, if you have access to bringing the tree in, uh, there may also be other areas within the Interlake where they do Christmas tree uh, wood chipping. Um, you might want to check in the uh, town of Selkirk. They might have a program like that as well. Um, but yeah, that would definitely be uh, a good option to look into. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and I hope you've had an enjoyable evening learning about wildlife in Manitoba and how you can protect them and protect yourselves. Hope that you are able to be wildlife smart in the future and hope to see you in our provincial parks in Manitoba. Have a great evening, everyone.